thanks for the invitation. It's a great pleasure for me to come to Chicago and give this seminar. Uh, uh, I have been enjoying the, you know, the fast uh, earlier this week. Uh, and today I want to share, uh, 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 you know, unlike my uh, typical work, I want to share a dark journey, which is the dark sector particles, uh, emphasizing on the sourced uh, dark sector particles, mini shard particles and dark photons. I hope to share some recent uh, progress in my work and uh, uh, let's look into the future. Okay, so. It's um, working, okay. Okay, it's working, right? So um, where we are now in particle physics, we are actually extremely successful. We find the best microscopic description of our universe. We are standing on the shoulder of our past success and looking for new physics and seeking new opportunities. Okay, so this dark journey of my, my talk is a particular journey I made uh, you know, uh, uh, into a different route than our traditional search uh, for new physics uh, uh, by you know, smashing energetic particles together and trying to uh, find the microscopic uh, physics. Uh, so, of course, uh, I will give you, uh, you know, just one slide of motivation. But of course, there, there can be a lengthy discussion on this, but uh, let's just say heuristically, right? We have U, our U1 electromagnetism. You can imagine there is a hidden sector, a right? separated sector that have their own U1 uh, uh, electromagnetism. Right. So you know, there's nothing to do with them with, uh, uh, between them uh, within the quantum field theory framework um, unless you start to build a bridge between them, right? Some higher scale physics could build a bridge between these two sectors, even though this sector could also have a low energy scale. But what's important is what, who builds a bridge, okay? It's, uh, there's a typical story of a kinetically mixed dark photon that can be mediated by many different sorts of UV physics, generically involves some particle charge that under both uh, gauge groups. Uh, but uh, the dark photon can be a force mediator, a, a bridge between those two sectors, and they will induce a series of interesting uh, 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 physics and uh, consequences. And that will be the focus of uh, the corresponding such heuristic setup would be the basics, uh, uh, basic uh, 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 a simple theory behind for the phenomenology and uh, the phenomenological opportunities we are trying to explore in this talk. Uh, of course, you can imagine the hidden sector also have their own electrons, right? So this uh, the, the kinetic mixing actually will induce the effective coupling of, uh, between our electromagnetism and the, the hidden electrons as well. There are very, uh, quite a few different variations, right? About uh, the massive dark photon, uh, massive dark photon, as well as you know, various limits that you can take. Uh, uh, you know, if uh, uh, again, uh, but for the sake of simplicity, for the first half part of my talk, let me just say, uh, although we can motivate this way, let me just by brute force, in, uh, you know, add in a, a, a Dirac fermion that has, uh, you know, uh, very small charge. Okay? Uh, the question I want to be I want to answer is that any are there any physical opportunities behind uh, uh, that uh, with today's technologies that can accelerate and make the new discoveries possible for such mini, possible mini charged particles? Okay, it's a huge heuristic and has many different variations. Uh, and but is the theory actually has uh, such generic theory actually has uh, you know various implications for cosmologists and, and others as well. But for the sake of simplicity, I did a couple of those. I just want to talk about the phenomenology of mini charge particles. Um, okay, so the what's the story? Okay, so here's a map as a function of the mini charge particle. There has been a lot of historical searches for mini charge particles. The left part is the last century. We have selected mini two experiments and at the colliders, we search for uh, uh, charged particles, fractionally charged particles. And back then, around uh, 2019, my collaborators and I were trying to think, well, are there other possibilities to look for those particles? For instance, also in the, uh, 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 in the literature, people propose uh, auxiliary detectors such as the Millikan experiment. Uh, there are actual Millikan limits that uh, should be on that plot, Jen. You know that very well. Oh, it's coming, it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's why I said back 2019, uh -huh. right, 2019, right? Uh, your your Millikan, <laughs> proton Millikan results coming, okay? So uh, uh, 2019 label, okay? But then that's not, okay? So. Uh, let me see, 
Well, uh, where, where's our proton millicon result here? But uh, uh, I, oh. Oh. <laughs> uh, I forgot my rotten tomatoes. Uh, uh, but oh no, it's there. Yes, it's the, dark, there. It's the be, blue. Must be here. But sorry, but uh, <laughs> uh, 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 it's a, it's a it's a light, and you didn't see the shaded region are the extinct existing limits, uh, 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 the solid lines, and the dashed lines are the various projected limits. So nowadays, this is a it's kind of a summary plot for the snow mass activity, and we can see there's a lot of proposed experiments trying to look for a mini charge particle. Mini charge. Uh, and uh, uh, we have the beautiful medical results here uh, <laughs> uh, uh, in the proton medical result in this uh, solid blue line. But today I will talk about another attempt we made. Uh, 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 we made uh, trying to look for uh, uh, mini charge particles. Okay. And there's a, a new uh, subs, uh, several new ingredients we're going to bring in, uh, actually brought in, in this year. Okay. So, what are we thinking about? Uh, what, why, how are we thinking about those mini charge particles? Right? I, we actually think uh, the American uh, uh, land, Chicago land, is a neutrino land right now, right? But those neutrino land is actually uh, uh, we want to repurpose the, their searches to do something else. We think we when we produce neutrino with smart proton on target, produce tons of pi on and look for the neutrinos, right, and see their properties. However, smashing protons to a target is a collider experiment. We actually produce tons of certain model particles out of source of mesons. They can actually give us the mini charge particles in pairs. Okay. Again, here I'm, uh, uh, I'm using a certain uh, very simplistic uh, 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 cartoon to describe the uh, uh, pair production. Uh, I think uh, it may be more useful or minimalistic to think about just I introduced the Dirac mini charge particles here. Okay. So we can produce tons of them because we have a high intensity experiment. Uh, uh, and the question is, how do we see them? Okay. So this part of the story is our journey began with, uh, uh, as um, Anada said, a tabletop experiment. It's a half a meter by half a meter by one meter. First generation liquid argon uh, TPC experiment. Uh, uh, they plan for future neutrino detections, but actually, after, within five months of data, we find this uh, can already set some world leading uh, constraints on, on, on new physics, on mini charge particles. Okay, and uh, what we are really trying to utilize is really the high uh, beam energy and high beam intensity, uh, giving, giving us tons of proton on the target uh, that enables us to uh, uh, explore uh, such, uh, such physics. Okay, so let's briefly talk about production. Okay, the high beam energy and the high proton on target, uh, uh, which tells us it would be a good source of mini charge particles. Here's uh, as a function of the uh, mini charge particle mass in units of GeV, uh, uh, vertical is how many of them will be uh, are, have been uh, accepted uh, by the, this uh, tabletop experiment of the first generation uh, liquid on TPC in the, in, the, in the US. Right? If the fractional charge is 10 to the minus two. Okay. Actually, the coming the 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 B charge uh, production coming from different processes, three by decays from uh, uh, pseudo scalar mesons of standard model, or two by decay from the vector mesons, as well as there's a draw in like uh, production. Each of them have uh, you know dominant at a different uh, regime of the particle mass. Of course, we understand there are kinematic uh, uh, limits for those uh, those different sources. But the important thing is uh, uh, the number of B charge particle produced. Is uh, by this many protons is huge. It's if the charge is like this, we have more than more than uh, ten billion mini charge particles from higher decays produced already and collected in that five months of data data touch, right? And uh, just to make sure uh, why this number is impressive, what we should have in mind is when we're thinking about smashing protons onto target. For this typical beam, that's going to be the beam. Uh, uh, the beam for Dion and others will be of similar uh, energy. Okay, it's a 120 GV beam smashing on some target, the proton, proton at the rest. Okay, each collision pr produces on average about 2.9 pi pi naught. Like uh, you know, a uh, fraction of them will be will be at the prime eta uh, uh, rho and omega, etc. It just gave you a sense of how many particles, standard model particles, we are going to produce. Tiny fraction of them will decay to a pair of uh, in decays, including, including a pair of mini charge particles. 
of course, is proportional to epsilon squared. And such an experiment, tabletop experiment, is located about one kilometer down the beam direction. Okay? Okay? So tiny angle, if you think about it, half a meter by half a meter divided by one kilometer, the, the, the angular acceptance is tiny. So you only accept about 10 to the minus five or 10 to the minus six of the total main charge particle produced. Nevertheless, you still have more than, uh, more than 10 billion such particles produced because of the high intensity. And of course, it's a beam down. So forward direction has uh, angular acceptance enhancement. But with such production, a uh, huge uh, production, what we want to ask is what their properties and how we look for them. For instance, uh, there's a typical energy distribution, right? Uh, from pi on decay, they are typically of sub 10 GeV, tens of GeV. From heavier meson decay, due to the kinematics, you actually are, uh, the central energy is higher and higher because you have to use up every energy you have to, to produce those uh, heavy uh, particles uh, on shell. And there's much less freedom for you to have transverse <laughs> momentum and also no X uh, when you transform from the left frame, a single mass frame to the left frame. Okay? But the general idea is, uh, you know, with such intense beam produce tons of mini charged particles and they are energetic, okay? tens of GeV. Okay? So the, after understanding the production, uh, it's interesting for us to understand the detection. Okay? The detection here will play a critical role in how we think about them. Okay? The, uh, uh, you can convert the scattering. Your mini charge particle is changed by a photon suppressed by a small, uh, uh, small, small charge, uh, exchanging with the, uh, you know, the, the uh, scattering with the electrons, for instance. You can calculate the differential scattering probability, which is slightly lengthy, but people are familiar with such kind of uh, scattering formulas. In the high energy limit, it can be uh, uh, reduced to this simple formula, 2 pi alpha squared, epsilon squared, over ER squared times electron mass, where ER is a recoil mass, a uh, recoil energy, which is, means how much energy you give to this electron that you scatter on. Okay? This gives us a typical scale of how we think about detection by doing the following. If you say, Obviously, the detection rate is dominated by low recoil energy, right? If you have a detection technology with the recoil energy threshold of one MeV, even the fractional charge is 10 to minus two, your mean free pass is one kilometer, okay? Which means several things in our consideration. For instance, okay? It means you, you, it's really hard to detect them. The detection rate will be small, right? Uh, on the other hand, uh, the, 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 the experiment we're thinking about, which are neutrino experiments, actually are using this liquid argon uh, detectors for their detection. It's claimed to be a, a clean, okay, I can do particle ID with an energy measurement. Okay, so this is a typical image of the liquid argon uh, 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 um, uh, detectors, which uh, again, I, I wouldn't go to too much details uh, in, uh, in this talk. Uh, but what's, uh, and it has gone through many development uh, and uh, there are many ongoing uh, of them are running as we, we saw the recent SBND just uh, put, into, uh, uh, put into place uh, a few, uh, last month. But uh, really this one is the first experiment we look into the argonaut that is uh, a, a really a small tabletop size uh, experiment took five months of data, okay? So, they have developed a long way to do neutrino detection, particle ID, charge current, et cetera, okay? But that's not what we're looking for. We're, what we are looking for, as we clearly see already, we are the scattering of our signals dominated by the low energy transforms, okay? And uh, having the epsilon parameter, the detection rate proportional to epsilon squared, you know, really tells us it's a low rate process. We really have to look for uh, the low threshold and low and low recall energy signals, which means those are obvious neutrino uh, events. But what the, that's not what we are looking for. We are looking for those small individual energy depositions in my in the images I'm taking. Okay, in this uh, in those such kind of experiments, just to give you a sense of how much such uh, uh, such kind of background exists is uh, the. Number of one hit background is about 10 to the six of them. That, and worse than that, and in the contrary to what we are used to as a particle physicist, as the colliders, those backgrounds are of various sources. I can never subtract them away. So I'm subject to, um, I'm subject to the, uh, sorry, uh, there are, sorry, I, I quoted the wrong number. Uh, okay. uh, some images, okay. So 
Uh, there are 10 to the six, three times 10 to the six frames I, uh, images I took, even data, even I record. About, uh, you know, uh, about 10% of them have more than one hit. Okay. That they could be in my signal, but they also can be background. I don't have a proper model of such a background. And uh, uh, unlike high energy collider experiments, uh, I, I have to say my signal cannot exceed this amount of background. If we just do that, uh, calculate the signal rate and derive the limit, the limit will be pretty bad because I cannot subtract away background. So when we start looking to this, we develop an interesting uh, new idea, but co slightly counterintuitive by saying, although your mean free pass is one kilometer, right? I have a meter long uh, detector, chance for me to see one hit is already one in a thousand. Why don't we look for two hits? You pay another one in a thousand this, uh, uh, chance in your signal rate, but it will gain you about five order magnitude of reduction in your background, okay? By the following uh, intuition. That is, if there's a truth level signal produced by smashing particle on the target, the, the particle, the main sharp particle fly in a straight line, leaving two hits. The hits are low energy threshold, MeV uh, energy exchange comparing to the tens of GeV energy. You will not deflect such particles. So those two hits will be aligned and point back to my target. But for my random background used by you know, radiation, cosmic rays, uh, slow neutron, whatever, they will be random distributed. They will not point back to my target location. So by paying one in a thousand signal uh, uh, rate uh, efficiency, actually even more than that, even one in, one in 10,000, because we are probing lower epsilons. Uh, you you beat more, you, the gain on the background is, is better. Okay? So why we actually propose uh, us to look for uh, uh, two heat uh, uh, signatures uh, for the signal. People may ask, uh, you know, how do we ensure the mini charged particle still goes through, go as a straight line in this uh, process? Because it's propagated about one kilometer. There's about uh, 500 meter of dirt in between. Okay? You can estimate the amount of energy loss as well as angular deflection you have. That fall into your angular acceptance for your signal uh, uh, information. And uh, 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 those can be calculated and modeled properly. After all of those, uh, we can calculate the, the, the matter effects and uh, uh, design our search for how aligned those two hits should be uh, pointing back to the target location. We propose such a two hit analysis that will give us a projection like the following. Again, this is back in 2019. Uh, the, that was the existing collide, uh, constraints back then. If I if I just decide to use uh, uh, the liquid argon experiment to uh, you know enter a neutrino beam to look for mini charge particle in one hit, the most naive one, you will have this limit. If you adapt our two hit strategy that we developed newly, uh, it will give you a much better sensitivity. Okay. Again, let me remind you. This is a mass versus a coupling plane in a log log space. So it's actually not a small space uh, for us to uh, gain sensitivity, okay? So after the theory calculation, we actually work with the afternoon to collaboration. Now we heard a bit about that with our NASA talk uh, in, uh, about two days ago, but really we open the data and we calculate how much of these two hit events can point back to a target uh, Imagine I put a screen on a target location where the particles are produced. How many of them are consistent with the you know the targets a target location? And we find exactly one event. Okay? And actually, that's exactly what I uh, I, I predict about 1.46 uh, background events. And the, the data uh, the experimental uh, search was uh, was very consistent with uh, uh, with uh, the, the prediction. The small fun story is uh, that uh, we find was, uh, you know, as a series who used to work at the high energy colliders, uh, it's uh, quite an experience to work on such, uh, you know, beam dump uh, setup. And uh, in the beginning, our experimental colleagues who are also learning how to do new physics, they actually find uh, much bigger access. They are find uh, 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 many events that, uh, uh, you know, seems like we already find a mini charge particle. But uh, uh, as a series, I told them, uh, you know, it's incompatible with my prediction. You better check your code. And uh, uh, probably they find the bug and they eventually come back to my theory prediction. Uh, I did a blended analysis, uh, but uh, they, they unblend and adjust their, uh, uh, you know, their analysis and uh, too much money. Okay? <laughs> um, but that's small collaboration. So this is a matching, right? This is the small two hit events that is uh, totally aligned 
Okay, if you extrapolate this uh, this line back by one kilometer, it will be back pointing back uh, at the target location. Okay. So this in that they will have to derive a new experimental result. That is this uh, out new experiment uh, uh, result that enable us to cover this new anything above this and exclude this uh, mean charge particle uh, above them. Okay, from this uh, uh, single event, as I have emphasized before, but uh, uh, you know it's a, it's a log log space improvement, and uh, more importantly, from the, the dependence on this small mixing uh, mini charge part uh, mini charge parameter epsilon is epsilon to the six power, two power from production rate, four power to hit twice. Okay, so six uh, to the six power of this epsilon parameter. So improvement in here, if it's by one order magnitude, it's six order magnitude the improvement uh, of SNR. So maybe I missed this earlier, but why uh, do you have those jagged features uh, ah. at higher mass? Ah, so so different. Each kick is actually a different. Uh, it's a different threshold you go over. This is a pi L threshold. This is a, you know eta threshold. There's an omega threshold. There's a draw. Yeah. So each uh, you know each heavy meson has a different rate, uh, and uh, there's a transition between them. And it's different from a typical search because there has no two hit search done before. So the the power difference is also different. Okay. So, uh, of course, as uh, mentioned uh, in my second or third slide, we have many other interesting experiments uh, came up, and uh, uh, the very uh, nice uh, uh, American experiment also had their uh, proto uh, type uh, result. Uh, well, you, you, here. You, you have one event and uh, looks like a signal. We, uh, it's consistent with my prediction because there's a 10 to the 5 of uh, you know random hits. Uh, okay, so, so, so if you have an expected reach versus uh, your actual reach, they agree. They agree. It's not a weaker than. Okay. Yeah, it's a great so well because I predict the 1.5 background in better one. So I, I, we can derive such a thing. Okay. Um, well, of course, you know, the next question you ask is uh, the obviously there's an upcoming big one, right? The big one is a dual experiment. Is that actually 300 times more intensity, many how many protons you scatter, right? 200 times, 40 times larger detector, and two times closer for the near detector. So if you multiply those numbers, you will obviously see I, at least I have uh, you know five or six order magnitude to get, five order magnitude to gain in my signal rate, right? However, same story. Okay. If I'm only able to do a one hit search where I don't know how to properly model my background, subtract them completely. Okay. Even if I have 10% residue, requiring my signal to not exceed that actually tells you my, my sensitivity would not improve. Okay. So you are, they will have to do a two hit or multi hit search. So if you do a two hit search, you will have this uh, sign band. The, the band is coming from, we don't know how to model all those random small energy depositions in the detectors as uh, you know, uh, uh, you know they, can, they come from many different sources. So, but the, the double hit uh, strategy is uh, still proven at least uh, from our calculation to be a, almost a necessary step if you want to use the dual experiments to look for many charge particles. And again, they are able to cover you know, much more space. Uh, yeah. So, we actually, you know, it, it's uh, 10 to the five close, uh, more acceptance for the signal, right? But the question is, we don't know how much more background you will increase in terms of number random hits background. So you can assume it's a scale up with the volume and of the detector, or you assume it's a scale up with the volume times the uh, uh, intensity times the geometric acceptance because you can be beam reduces related to slow neutrons and other produced secondary particles. So you don't know how much background you encounter with the two different scaling you predict uh, how, how, how much you will get. And let, let me ask a related question. So, yeah. um, imagine you see a signal and you want to detect a five sigma discovery. What, where that line would be? Okay, so uh, that's, uh, that's uh, there's a, there are actually many, several different handles, okay? So uh, using two, uh, uh, two hit strategy uh, is almost necessary, right? It tells you, oh, I have a number of uh, two hit events pointing back to my detector. Actually, if you think about it, standard model, normal particle don't do that because if you have any energetic particle, it will be a huge track, right? So the, the hits are a symbol of low energy events, 
Okay, so the, 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 they are strange. There are many things you can already do statistical tests on these two hits. You can test, uh, you know, their distance, uh, the separation between these two hits, are they consistent? And also you can check the energy deposition. There's energy distribution on these two hits. You can measure if it's consistent with the earlier formula I show you or show you. And also there's consistent prediction of three hits events as well, more energy ones. It becomes slightly rarer, but it still that can be done in a, in a, in a predictable way. So there are many diagnoses you can do after the discovery. Okay, so it's not uh, uh, you know only a living setting machine, which uh, does uh, is not what we want. Okay, so is there some uh, target you want to reach? Uh, there are some target I want to reach. Uh, um, uh, uh, um, other people have targets. Uh, I don't. Okay. Well, what are other people's targets? Uh, so I was, uh, let me, that's the slide I skipped, uh, but uh, let me see. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you should tell us what the, why the search is exciting. So. Uh, is what? Why the search well, is exciting. Well, if you find something, it's always yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, well, for instance, uh, one of the, the reason there was. Uh, but there must be a, a reason. Uh -huh. There must be a reason. <laughs> Maybe there are no reasons. Well, why right not? Well, I mean, eventually you, you could make these so yes, dark yeah. matter through freezing. <laughs> Sorry? Eventually you could make it dark matter through freezing, but that target is much lower than what's being shown. Yeah, I'm sure it's a little bit far away. It's a little yeah. far, yeah. Oh. So, okay. well, yeah. I thought that you had a workshop on gamma. So. Yeah. Uh, this is more interesting. Okay, <laughs> ah, sorry, I, I think you're right. Ah, so, so for instance, so again, I show you there's a lot of progress in this field. In fact, it was uh, sort some of them motivated by the ages and ages and not right. It, uh, but that's somewhat different assumption. They require the dark, uh, the main charge particle to be a, a fraction of dark matter. They have lines where you can help with, you know, uh, explain the edges anomaly. There are cer certain targets uh, and the projected sensitivities of, of various kind of experiments, which uh, uh, you know Gordon can comment more more if uh, you, uh, you know if, uh, you want to say what what's the most motivated target in your mind? I, I think you got the ones right there. I mean, the best one maybe also would just be the freezing curve, but that's for Q of like ten to the minus ten, so that's a little far. Yeah. However, uh, yes, that's a, can be a target for direct detection, but not it's not a target I would want for my source experiment, right? Yeah, I right. don't I don't rely on assumption that it is a, is a stock matter. Sure, but yeah. if you could exclude yeah. that with your sourced experiment, yeah. that would also uh, yeah, settle yeah. the issue. Yeah, of course that will help. Okay. But uh, uh, I um, I'm a pretty neutral guy, so uh, <laughs> I have to say you're not neutral. You're millicharged. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Oh, sorry, I, I cannot sell stuff that well. So, <laughs> uh, good. But uh, that's the result we find, and we we think that paper wrote for future detections. But now, now let's come back to what we are talking. We were talking about. Let's come back to how do we see many charged particles? Okay. So, let me remove the lens formula. Just come back to this simple one. Okay. The problem we are facing is the low detection rate. Okay. Mean free parts of one kilometer. For even smaller mini charge, it can be you know 10, 100 kilometer. So I don't have a huge detector to look for this. Okay. Uh, current way is to reduce the recall energy as an energy threshold for my detection. Okay. So in fact, in fact, you know, what if we we ask if, what if we lower the threshold? Okay. Compared to the liquid argon detector, which are for free from the neutrino experiment. There's another series of dark matter experiment to look using so-called the skipper, skipper CCD. Basically, you can just view them as a better cameras who have no noise levels. Okay, so their threshold is about 10 eb with the current uh, experiment. Okay, so if you think about it, okay, the single hit the detection rate from, from a liquid argon with one MeV threshold going to 10 eb skipper CCD is about five order magnitude the increase in your signal detection rate for single hit, and if you look for double, you, it's a huge enhancement for your for your signal. Okay, so, uh, uh, and uh, so if we think about single scattered uh, detection uh, parametrics, right, the detection rate is actually proportional to the volume, okay, because I have to accept those mini charge particle producing to this, I have to have a chance to let it interact. So volume is a proper measure for the detection. Uh, we think about, of course, our friends and, uh, you know, uh, pioneering the skipper CDD dark matter experiment called Sensei, 
they have data, they have, they have measurement. It's a three gram experiment, okay? Three gram on a chip, okay? A few hundred micron thickness is about 10 to minus five smaller compared to the tabletop where I was talking about the liquid argon prototype experiment, okay? So at this point, you see I get nothing, okay? I increase the signal rate for a single hit by five order magnitude. I reduce the signal rate by five orders magnitude. Okay, uh, so, uh, uh, um, but one should be, uh, one should think a, a bit more about them is this three gram of uh, uh, detector is my recent result with the sensor collaboration, which basically, you know, uh, I repeat the measurement of the, you know, the image that you can reduce the noise arrow. If it's one electron, it is one electron, et cetera. So they have no noise level uh, uh, camera trying to detect energy depositions with the threshold of 10 GB, okay? Uh, what we find is from my estimation that they try conform with, with the collaboration is with the three gram of the detector with three days of data, they could already set new constraints, okay? That is a new result derived uh, uh, you know, earlier this month uh, from the collaboration. Again, this curve is much more complex than before than when I showed the 2019 result that already contains our argued experiment result, contains the proto result, contains the reintegration B, B, C, and others, okay? But nevertheless, this three gram of three days of dark matter experiment happened to be located in front of the beam under the minnows hall and already put the new constraints. When I first derived such a result, I was already, you know, I have to sit there and think of it. You know, we were talking about tons of, uh, you know, liquid argon experiment compared to this three gram. Uh, they are comparable, right? The three gram already can even achieve uh, some new uh, new sensitivities here. Okay. So you may ask the question, I just told you there's no gain. In which rate uh, decreased uh, 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 acceptance, so there's no gain. Right. However, what I didn't tell you is the, the background. Okay? After passing the 10 EV threshold, they have no, no background in this device. Okay? Instead of having to the five single hit the background in the nutrient liquid argon experiment, they have zero background uh, in such a setup. Okay? They don't promise it to have zero background in the future runs, but at least with current data, it is already enable us to uh, 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 new sensitivities. But of course, the obvious thing is to think about the future, right? Uh, we have a three gram run here. If we just, instead of doing three days, we do three months, uh, we do one month, okay? You will have new sensitivity like this, okay? Again, log log space improvement is quite impressive. And there's already planned the Oscura experiment. Uh, they, you know, in production of 10 kilogram of such skippers as you need. They will derive a much better uh, sensitivities here. And uh, if you do, uh, you know, if you put in the uh, under the more intense beam for prepare for doing uh, for our Scura experiment, you will be able to achieve uh, this kind of curve. So, okay. how many years for Scura? So, our Scura, uh, uh, our Scura, this, this, this number of POT with current Yumi beam is about, uh, you know, one month. A few months is okay. No, no, how yeah. many years uh, how away many? from us is to correct 10 kilograms? Uh, I think they already produced the one kilogram at this point. Uh, uh, question. Why the fall off also for Sensei above, a significant fall off above whatever it is, 1.5 GB or so? Ah, again, so uh, that's actually related to the question Gordon asked. What are the dominant production modes for the mini charger particle, right? Mm -hmm. I'm smashing a 120 GB beam on the proton, okay? I, I really, it's really hard for me to produce anything, uh, uh, you know, anything above three G. There's no chance for me to produce anything about, above a J per side. Okay, okay? that's right. So the rest is just the draw, typical draw in yeah, has a very suppressive. That's effect. right, but yeah. at a collider, we still have those other production modes. Right, right. So, so I- Because we're getting those drill yen. That's right. So uh, that is, this is the kinematic limit for such a beam dump environment. And a collider, uh, I do have a medical, uh, medical yeah. projections, right? You, yeah. you will have this region. Yeah. Okay. So uh, again, uh, yeah, but that's, uh, that's all consistent, right? The yeah, I forgot the energy is much yeah. better. Yeah, yeah. So 
But uh, uh, again, I, I, uh, uh, this is my serious uh, projection, right? I'm, uh, I'm always, uh, you know, simplistic, optimist, optimistic. But later on, we work with the Oscura collaboration uh, to make a better, to make a projection. Okay, they were unsure about how many background they would have. You know, uh, you know, you know passing certain thresholds. So have different models. They actually love our multi heat story a lot, but you will pay the price of epsilon to the sixth power. So that depends on whether I'm to employ double his or triple his strategy, you have different projections. If there's one hit is enough, have no background, you will achieve something consistent with my prediction. But if you have other source of background, you will, you will have to do something else. But it will still give you new coverage in those uh, 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 in this regime. Okay. So coming back to uh, uh, what the question uh, uh, Carlos asked earlier, right? Again, this one, I rely on single hit. The question is, can we do discovery? I think the answer is yes, even with a single, because the the, the detection rate uh, is as a function of recall energy is uh, is you know slowly falling, one over er falling. Okay, so you can choose the window how many energy uh, you know I uh, threshold I can I can try to check if it's consistent with that. So if I find a model, you know, access of one hit event with low energy deposition, if they uh, uh, consistent with the, uh, this curve uh, with the formula, it will be a strong evidence. Uh, but I believe there will be many other checks we have to do, right? Uh, uh, and we are able to do many other checks to do multi his uh, et cetera, as well. So the lessons we learned from this series with my dark journey was uh, uh, maybe we should open our mind to utilize the local intense sources and uh, uh, you know uh, those uh, free environment we have for the neutrino experiment to look for many charged particles and also use our uh, free dark matter particle search uh, friends uh, work to, to look for those particles. Okay. So of course the work, our estimation is meaningful we actually impact the, how they plan to conduct the experiment. Okay. For dark matter search, you just need to put in some quiet environment. You don't need to put in from a beam. But because we show it is possible to do interesting physics, they do plan to put their device uh, in the beam hall uh, to look for such a mini charged particle. You know what, what Oscura means? Uh, I don't. Uh, dark. Dark. Okay. It's consistent with my dark journey. So thanks. <laughs> uh, okay. Good. Okay, so uh, so that's uh, my first part, but I would have to say it's also a fast developing uh, uh, frontier. What I have been focusing on is a beam source, the uh, uh, mid charge particle, right? I, which I don't, uh, there are many other complementary probes that there, is, uh, there can be other source, like atmo atmospheric production of mid charge particles. You can derive some interesting limits. And, and projections, but also, you know, you can assume it's part of the dark matter and do some other direct detection experiments. And people even try to derive, uh, you know, if, if, I, uh, if, it can, if it's dark matter, or I can enable some new searches using ion tribes and other cavity-like experiments. But I just want to say, uh, under, you know, if I zoom out, right, there's a collider, there's a, what we are talking about projections, there's many other projections and also as the supernova constraints and BBM constraints, uh, effective constraints also. Okay. So uh, even for such a simple setup, there are many interesting physics you can do, and uh, uh, for particle physics, so uh, already we can do a lot more than what we thought uh, can be done. Okay. Um, so this is the first part of my dark journey. I want to really switch quickly to my to the second part of my dark dark journey, and uh, you know uh, some of you may heard about it. Uh, and uh, Ronnie showed one slide of this, but I hope to tell a bit more about the parametrics here. Okay, so uh, we look for dark photons in the experiment called the Dark Eyes RF. It's a uh, uh, work we put out in January this year and uh, has been accepted. It'll be published soon. Okay, uh, so there are many paths and the future experiment to look for dark photons. But this recent result is a joint effort between Minnesota, uh, me, and uh, uh, Fermilab. Our result in as functional uh, dark photon mass was a, a, a small a kinetic mixing parameter epsilon. Uh, we can cover the new parameter regions in this uh, uh, dark photon parameter space. All the other ones are the, uh, the past and the existing uh, experimental results. Okay, so. Uh, Again, it's such a simple setup, and historically there are there are many searches. That's a plot you will see in the you know summary uh, talks. But uh, how many different kind of attempts? How many different lab-based experiments was astrophysics and cosmology constraints on those uh, 
uh, uh, uh, dark photon uh, searches. Mm -hmm. And our experiment uh, give you a new uh, blob here. I will not hide that uh, we, when you zoom out, it's uh, you know it's an incremental change. Okay. Although, I, as I emphasize, it's a big log and log plot. We still uh, achieve quite a bit. Uh, These are concern. existing experiments or? Our existing constraints. These are all our, existing, our constraints. existing constraints. Some of them assume dark photon is dark matter. That's that's right. So that's uh, you don't you don't assume. Yeah, that. that's the right question, right? Uh, I want to do a source dark photon. I don't want to rely on the, uh, the assumption that they are dark matter, that they are full dark matter, etc. So instead, if you remove the dark matter assumption, that's the existing constraints. Again, the red ones are more or less lab-based constraints. The other colors are more, uh, you know, astrophysics-based uh, uh, constraints, and cosmology-based constraints. Our is quite a unique new range that we're talking into yeah. that do not rely on that assumption. Okay. So, sorry, can I just ask? Uh, can yeah. we go back uh, to the previous slide? This with dark one. matter, right? Yeah. So here, this black hole super radiant, but why does that depend on the kinetic mixing? Uh, it doesn't. So it's uh, uh, so first of all. First of all, it's due to the screen color, is like this vertical line oh, going that way. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Second, that, that's... Yeah. Second, there is actually recent development to say that is a, a wrong calculation. We shouldn't show such a such a line here. Okay. Do, yeah. yeah. So it's, um, a <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a somewhat wrong assumption about you know what uh, you know what um, uh, you know. Put in uh, the wrong calculation. Uh, the, <laughs> The, the famous group. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's actually about a stuff for a group. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's not a wrong calculation. So there's a, one assumption they made that was uh, was uh, was not uh, correct. Even yeah, worse, the calculation was correct. But yeah, by one assumption. Yeah, yeah. There's uh, some you know plasma simulation about how much angular momentum you can extract. Innocent. Out. What are yeah. the, maybe innocent. Yeah. Innocent. Yeah. Well, what are the <laughs> you know, flux, uh, et cetera. There's a certain. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, but why why the shape of the maybe you're going to get into this? Why the shape of the dark SRF line? Ah, good. Why does it follow this uh, curve that a lot that some of the dark matter ones follow? Uh, so you mean this one? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I will tell you a bit about parametrics uh, uh, in the uh, next few slides. Okay. So let, let me explain what is dark SRF. Okay. So we come to a new space, uh, actually, with a very small tabletop experiment. Uh, uh, what what do we do? Okay. It's a light handling through wall experiment. Mm -hmm. I prepare a laser, trying through a wall, trying to find it, uh, trying to detect. If there's no dark photon, I see nothing. Right? If there's dark photon, by paying a price of epsilon, I can don't interact with wall. I penetrate, and I have to pay another epsilon price. I can hit my detector. This is already simplified the picture uh, in certain parametric estimation. This is give you a correct uh, certain correct correspondence. Let me go to my uh, the experimental setup to try to give you a slightly better parametric addition. Okay, uh, but why do we wh what do we do? What's SRF? Right? So actually, as a collider physicist uh, and the accelerator people, we have the best cavities in the world. Okay? They have uh, superconducting real frequency cavities. They can hold large field and have maintain high quality factors. Uh, this that we build them for accelerator to achieve our high energy co collision. Okay? But uh, they can be used to do light shining through wall experiment because I can power up one of the cavities with a lot of photons that does not penetrate to the superconducting wall. Okay? And uh, that, but that photon, will be able, so I be able to penetrate the wall. So I actually generate a dark photon field, okay? Paying the price of F H squared, actually, uh, in, the, you know, in, the, in power, okay? And that, the new cavity is, uh, you know, it's like a detector after the wall. I should see nothing, there's no dark photon, but actually there's a chance, I'm immersed under dark photon field. I should be able to see, uh, you know, power transmission between this emitter and this receiver, okay? Uh, what the high quality bias us? The high quality means I can accumulate a lot of uh, photons in the right frequency in the right phase, and uh, they will. Uh, I have a controlled source, and in my receiver, I can. High quality means even though you know the collection of uh, power is very slow, right? Uh, I can maintain them for a longer time to pass a certain threshold of detection. So quality matters to enhance my detection possibility. And that's why we want to bring up, uh, bring, reuse this uh, accelerator technology devices to look for uh, dark photons. Okay, 
So let me give us a better parameterization here. Okay, for those who are uh, uh, um, familiar with the, uh, the dark photon series, right? In fact, you know the Lagrangian I began with showing the first part of my slides actually tells you there is only one linear combination of the two vector boson field, one is massless and one is massive, top two electrons. After I tried to do you know, uh, you know canonical normalization. Okay, and I put the power here. So electron as a source actually has a linear combination of photon and dark photon, but they have different mass. Okay, one is massive, one is massive. So while the wave is propagating, I generate the right phase between these two components. Okay, that means the expectation value for the mode that is orthogonal to this linear combination that the couples with electrons is non-zero. So I will, I will. By the right to phase, I generate a non-zero mode that couples doesn't couple to electron that generate this dark photon field. So that's why you can estimate uh, the amount of dark photon field you produce is of course proportional to this parameter, but also proportional to the right to phase generated. That is proportional to m squared or omega squared. Okay, so that means answer uh, 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 David's question. Okay, the relative phase is of course important. So if the mass is zero, the relative phase will be zero. I will never generate a, a such a mode that does not couple to electron. Mm -hmm. So that's why for lighter and lighter dark photon masses, my, my I don't generate the relative phase. I don't I don't generate the mode that is transparent uh, to this uh, uh, cavity wall. I don't I don't have sensitivity. Okay. Uh, so of course, in detail, there are many interesting calculations you can do, and uh, you know, parametrics and proportion, the emitter quality factor, receiver quality factor, how much power you have, what's the wave function overlap between those dark fields and uh, you know the modes in my receiver, and you can have this mass of omega parametrics as estimation. So the, the only thing we conclude from this is that whoever wrote this was you. Uh, Doesn't know how to abbreviate. Uh, uh, Q receiver Q emitter Q P <laughs> T temperature T. Uh, Except for comments from the peanut gallery, I have another question. Uh, so if you if you if you put a buffer gas in in there, would that uh, change the wave function overlap? Kind of like what CAS did for axions to extend the uh, the the mass range of uh, the the CAS sensitivity. Okay, so. Let me let me let me tell you the difference briefly. Let me uh, we can answer that after my talk. Okay? okay. So let me emphasize: those are quite different setup. Okay. Cool. This experiment is I'm sourcing a, 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 a photon field. I'm trying to measure the photon field. I know exactly what's the, what's the energy. Okay. So I'm trying to exactly look for the mode I exact I, I source. Okay. So uh, uh, there's uh, putting gas uh, will not do much for me. But for the other experiment, they are actually dark matter detection experiment. They are waiting, they are in a narrow band search, trying to find the dark matter that hitting the resonant frequency of, of, the, of the cavity they are trying to detect. If I add in some other material, change the, change the you know, reflection index, et cetera, change the fundamental frequency of that cavity they are sensitive to. So they're actually adding other uh, uh, materials trying to change the frequency to do a scan. Uh, for us, is uh, we know exactly the frequencies. We don't do a scan. We're just looking for, uh, we're just looking for the, the dark photon. Okay. okay. My point was, could you extend the range of frequencies that you are able to generate? Yeah. So we will be able to do. We will be able to do that. Uh, but we, by far, have exhausted our our uh, uh, you know methods yet, right? Because you see, as I show you in the first slide, we are not a sharp peak single frequency sensitivity. We are just we actually have a slope here. We cover a huge, huge band because, because so long as your dark photon mass is smaller than the frequency you are exciting, I can excite them without problem. It's just the right view phase is proportional to the mass. Okay? So I have a broad band sensitivity to begin with. And the, 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 the gaining for changing the frequency a bit it does not uh, help directly. Instead, what we can do is let me build a few other cavities and try to look for other, other you, know, you know, just use them. We don't need to do this fine tuning yet. Okay. But maybe after the discovery, we can try to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, to, to focus the system. Okay. So, sorry, so maybe yeah. this is a related question, yeah. but um, 
you have two cavities and you control the frequencies of the modes in each one, mm -hmm. right? Now they have to be very close to each other, right? Yes. Yeah. So I like how close and like how, how that, that's literally a fine tuning question. We're yeah. like, how uh, far away can the other cavity be in terms of frequency for this to still be a good strategy? Uh, you mean frequency space or physical separation? I mean, frequency. Frequency space. Uh, that's the core of the question I'm going to show you later, okay? And you will see the, the suppression you can estimate by your Lorentzian uh, distribution, uh, Lorentzian uh, distribution calculation, okay? Uh, it's actually uh, uh, a very interesting question I'm going to discuss uh, later on, okay? But really, basically, that uh, even though cause could complain the, the, the location, uh, actually, I tried to, and this helped make things clear because there are so many Q's. Uh, and when I write the paper, so many Q's and so many P's and so many T's. Okay, they all mean different stuff. So I'm doing as a favor to write down a clarity for you. So, Thank you. Uh, yeah. So uh, I, when you read the other papers, you will see many, many different confusing patterns because we're working across different fields. So things are quite different. Of course, uh, the reality is more complex. We have to do the calculation more properly, look at the real time, real geometry, and do the you know a uh, 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 overlap calculation, numerical stability, etc. But it's just an uh, you know, interesting calculation and uh, and uh, uh, adventure for me. But uh, so you do it numerically? How do you? Uh, yeah, I, I, they, they gave us the, the, the magnetic field the detail, you know, configuration of the magnetic field distribution uh, of electric field distribution. I calculate the, the, yeah, the generated alpha one field and also the, the, the induced signal, so called G factor, about how much collected from here to here you transmit. Okay. Of course, we did the experiment. That's why we have a result to report. Uh, I don't know if it's a good strategy to not write a serial paper, just directly come with an experimental result. Uh, we, I saw it will be done in 2019, but it actually took out four years to make it happen, uh, to finish it, okay? Uh, 2019, we're already here, okay? Welcome to experimental physics. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one emitter, one receiver, you ask physically how far they are apart. This is about, uh, you know, uh, 20 centimeter, I believe. So it's you know four, uh, you know some half a meter separation uh, between them. You know those devices are going to put into the so-called VTS, uh, uh, a vertical testing stand, but it's really just two Kelvin uh, fridge that you put in there. Okay. Uh, I have my photo with that just to let you know the scale of such experiment. But you didn't touch it, with it. I, I didn't. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have to, you will be better. Uh, we will find out. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, we. I will touch it someday, just to make sure uh, I'm serious. They don't always uh, screw up experiments. So uh, people did a measurement and people are very happy. Okay, 2019. But uh, we keep on asking for more cross checks of various assumptions that enable us to derive results. So let me skip the details of the runs and data taking and uh, you know frequency matching, etc. But just tell you the result. Well, I guess that's directly Gordon's question. Uh, uh, you will, I will have another part re-emphasize that. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, it's actually the, the vision part more important than the than the steps. Okay. So here is the result. Okay. Frequency space was so how much power I have in the receiver, which I'm supposed to measure nothing. Okay. But I measure something. There's a resonance peak. Okay. Okay. This resonance peak is there for both runs, the search run and the thermal run, which means one run, I power up that meter and try to see something. The other run, I don't power up that meter, I'm just waiting there, okay? So this is a background run, this is a signal run, okay? So you can compare them and uh, zoom in by another three of magnitude. That is already, you know, a kilo, uh, this is, uh, you know, six uh, like gigahertz, so I'm zooming in nine orders magnitude to see those two peaks, okay? Okay, those two peaks, First of all, are hyper consistent with each other. Okay, although they look have different ways because there are several effects I'm going to introduce you uh, soon. Okay, related to Gordon's question, but uh, our treatment is the following. Okay, we know the thermal run. There's no signal. There's a signal search run. We can compare those two runs. Okay, uh, let's take the window, a broad window that is large enough. You know, just to and do a counting experiment. Let's do, do not uh, fit the shape of this, uh, the, uh, those two peaks. Of course, those are the resonance peak of the, of the device. Count the number of photons to see if they're consistent. 
Okay, they are very compatible with each other, and they are within one sigma of what what my uh, uh, theory, uh, uh, prediction uh, of the uncertainties and the, and the counting. Okay, so uh, then we can derive a limit demanding the dark photon cannot exist uh, with a carbon strength such that uh, you know exceeding you know two sigma of uh, you know the difference between uh, 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 the, the, this two, this two uh, 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 two runs. Of course, I took my RC knowledge to do a CRS method to, to derive that result. Um, uh, nevertheless, this enable us to you know you see the uncertainty experimental is like uh, for cavities like this units uh, dBm uh, is uh, you know log ten base ten times log ten based uh, mini what in power okay you have to do a lot of uh, mental practice to be happy with them but nevertheless you are able to derive this new result okay uh again new log space results okay but but okay that's not the way what i propose okay when i propose such an experiment uh my predicted the search sensitivity over the past vendor run should be this okay? yeah. Okay, so it's uh, quite a few other magnitude difference in what we have achieved than what uh, my initial estimation. And it was not an excess. Uh, um, <laughs> um, I mean, it was, uh, uh, it's not about access. It's actually about the, the assumption, about uh, what we think the signal efficiency is. As going back to Gordon's question, okay? So what happens between here and here? In fact, if I just blindly use the formulas and mass I tell you earlier, okay, do the calculation, I will achieve here, okay? It's an additional penalty factor I put in that delayed us for a few years, but I believe that assumption need to be there, uh, at least as a first result, uh, that changed the result back to this very conservative one. If I do this one, I think it will be very obvious in those, uh, summary plus, right? Okay? And actually will be the best lab-based uh, photon mass limit as well, okay? So that is because high quality factor is not always a blessing. We are, tr I'm trying to sing and dance. There's a high quality factor that give us a gaming, okay? And we actually are the uh, highest quality factor experiment of this kind. Before people do 10 to, nine, five, 10 to the five, 10 to the six, or 10 to the 10 quality factor, okay? That's exactly what, uh, what uh, 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 people have, uh, 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 you know, Gordon has asked, okay? High qualified factor is a double-sided sort, okay? The past finder did not benefit as Q square for the following reason. Okay? The line width of the, my, uh, my signal amplifier, which is my receiver, is omega over Q, it's a sub-hertz level, okay? Which means when I try to ring up the receiver, they, the emitter and the receiver frequency have to be matched at this level, okay? Just like when you try to do this tuner, right? The frequency of these two devices have to match in order to bring this one up, right? From by bringing up this one, okay? So the, the map frequency alignment have to be better than sub Hertz level. But just to give you a sense of the physics scale, okay? Line width of points 13 Hertz, sub Hertz scale of matching for a 20 centimeter uh, cavity means its shape has to be stable, at the nano sub nanometer level, okay? And there are so many things that can perturb the device. You know, there's your, you know, you know, hit the bath, there's bubbles burst on the surface, give you, uh, you know, give you pressure, tiny pressure change that changes your, your, your shape. Here is touching things. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think, uh, yeah, if I touch that, it's probably uh, yeah. much bigger, much bigger. Uh, you were tempted and you did touch it. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, maybe at my wrist. Uh, uh, this is uh, not a nanometer level device. So if you touch it, you may make the Q factor lower. Uh, uh, there, there must be an optimal Q. Uh, uh, Worse uh, than the Q. Uh, 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 before we talk about the optimal Q, we have to be under a discussion of the optimal op algorithm and search strategy. We have no reach there yet. Okay. As of yesterday, I was discussing with SQM people how to update the search protocol to reach better results. Okay. But frequency mismatch is important, right? As the highest Q factor device, I have to ensure that. And we didn't, we couldn't ensure that in our test run. This is a tight run frequency stability uh, mm -hmm. calibration. As a function of time, it's about 100 minutes. That's how the central frequency have been drifting around. So there are two physical effects. 
frequency drift that is slow change in the frequency and the frequency jittering microphonics that is going up and down okay in fact going up and down shall be measured they, you know this sample rate of this uh, uh, central frequency is too low that it's already average over the amount of jump up and down so the up and down we call it microphonics its amplitude is about 3.1 hertz and the frequency drift is about 5.7 hertz if I uh, uh, try to measure the biggest difference between those frequencies over 100 minutes. Our search is only 30 minutes, okay? We're not doing a long history per long integration time. But nevertheless, okay, uh, there's other effects, uh, much larger than language you know, your signal trying to pick up. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? Well, uh, there's many other interesting, you know, line shape measurement and, uh, you know, what the, the receiver, what's the emitter, and, uh, you know, how things change with time. Uh, you can see uh, various uh, calibrations, but now, but let's skip all those. Uh, just to say what we decide to do, right? What we decide to do is let's model. It's highly far away from optimal, okay? This can be improved. Let's model that because of the drifting and the frequency jittering, let's assume this emitter and receiver are always off resonance, okay? I pay a huge penalty factor to assume I never try to excite the right mode. It's my emitter. I'm trying to measure the, re the, the receiver frequency uh, 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 power here. So what this assumption reduces your signal efficiency. Uh, you know, if you put everything modeled as mismatching frequency, it reduces your uh, 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 signal efficiency by five orders of magnitude. That was drives this big jump in my prediction was a uh, uh, result because we very conservatively model the effect as of resonance. Okay, uh, and this we know is not true. We are on resonance when we start the machine, right? And uh, these two drifting and jittering effect are behavior in different uh, uh, cases, and one can calibrate them by making uh, you know multiple measurement and shorten measurement time and do a frequency match in the middle. So there are many things can get around this. So, but uh, nevertheless, we learned a lot in such. Uh, you, you can model it just as a modification to the quality factor. Uh, um, but how do I say my? <laughs> Yes and no. Okay. Because so, because the emitter the, the the emitter almost doesn't matter, right? Uh, it's it's the receiver. It's the efficiency of the of the receiver for whatever the frequency of the emitter was for whatever frequency the emitter was at. Um, but if if you've now detuned your receiver a little bit isn't could you could you effectively model that as a reduced q or uh, so uh for one of the effect i could okay so the drifting effect i is not modelable as a reduced q no 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 it's more the than microphonics the microphonics can be models as uh, reduce the Q and there are certain assumptions okay, okay. And there's a different way of modeling that you can also view jittering as reduce the number of integration time for my measurement off the peak on the peak, mm -hmm. okay? They actually, those two different modeling give you different scaling mm -hmm. and they miss by one power. So I'm currently working with our student and postdoc try to you know explore how to problem uh, the model microphonics. But my answer lies somewhere between time domain and frequency domain discussion, mm -hmm. either as a reduced Q or as a okay. reduced integration time, okay? Again, uh, that will that model will be much better than this uh, assumption. So, so it will give us much better results. Okay, so we learned a lot, and uh, here's the future. My initial prediction. Now it's done with a bit, but uh, you know the selling uh, so, uh, plus is if you can continuously improve the device and make the frequency match and uh, reduce the amount of microphonics, you can you know I'm putting the dilution fridge lower the thermal noise temperature. You can you can go to the so-called quantum regime, but it's really just multi-photon regime. Can improve Q further and also do a phase sensitive readout of the receiver because the receiver signal we can predict what's the phase of the exciting uh, uh, photon here. So you can achieve much more with in such a kind of uh, sensitivity plot, and uh, the collaboration is uh, in, on its path uh, towards uh, towards there. And it's a very active field, right? People can do a dark matter search. People can also modify the, the cavity and put in different uh, setup, trying to do, uh, you know, uh, axion search, axion action through wall, axion dark matter search. 
You can even do a, a gravity wave or mini type particle search. So all of those are up in the air at this point. There are proposals, but technology has is under investigation. Okay, but they, you can see many of the discussions in the collaborations uh, uh, outlook paper. So let me summarize here. I think I share with you, sorry, I went over time a bit, my fine journey to go to the unknown and the physics at different scales. Uh, and for the particle, mini charge particles, uh, we develop a new search strategy, propose new search and new result obtained at the neutrino liquid argon experiment, but also in the dark matter search experiment and change their future uh, strategies. And uh, for a dark photon, we have, we designed a new uh, cavity-based experiment and uh, derived a new result, learned a lot, carried out the you know, highest, uh, high Q, ultra high Q opportunities and understand much better. And we are on our way to, to improve and get a better result. In fact, our, you know, we are continuously making progress about uh, the devices. We already see many improvements uh, achieved by our, collaborate, our, coll our collaborators. I think there's an active program ahead, ahead because there are many planned steps to improve the results significantly. And there are many possible serial research directions to improve the results uh, and treatment. And also there are many adjacent uh, searches and explorations one can, one can do for other dark sector models. Thank you. Great, we had many questions during the talk, but any further things? Uh, so in Milliken, we had a bit of a hard time uh, with understanding or justifying the um, sort of accuracy of, let's say, Jayant models for the detector response, you know, for the, the you know, plastic scintillator, the, you know, uh, uh, light response to very small charges. Uh -huh. um, you know, so in the end, uh, we kind of took a very hand wavy uncertainty on that. Mm -hmm. What I, I can imagine the issues are very different though for Argon. Um, uh, and I was just curious if you could comment on that at all. I mean, I know the neutrino community is doing an enormous amount of work in general regarding the, you know, the, the sort of nuclear physics of, of the neutrino interactions, but what about um, um, the, the milli-charged particle interaction? Very good, very good. So uh, 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 um, actually the milli-charged particle signal efficiency in the two, set, two, two setups uh, actually require different, different models. Okay? Mm -hmm. In the liquid argon environment, what we have calculated is the milli-charged particle electron scattering, which is, much more certain with one yeah. MeV energy transfer. So you can ignore the binding energy of the electron with the, mm -hmm. with the nucleus. Mm -hmm. It's not a mean charge particle with the nucleus scattering. Yeah. So it, you, can, you can ask the question, does your new, uh, uh, mean charge particle scatter with nucleus? Uh, the answer is yes as well, but uh, the rate is sub is lower because you see there's one or M target uh, suppression. Yeah. Yeah. So in that sense, uh, energy transfer is so energy transfer is so high on those uh, you know we can ignore binding energy the, the uncertainty associated with that is quite small mm -hmm. for, for our signal detection for interestingly for the ultra low threshold uh, skipper CD scanning yeah. you will have to fully embrace the uh, 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 the band structure and uh, you know the, the transfer so you you actually have you have the people, the community have been trying to approach this question, uh, you know, from a dark matter direct detection point of view. But there's various, uh, you know, condensed matter, uh, you know, uh, 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 calculation, as well as there can be calculations done by, you know, uh, by various uh, processes. There's, uh, you know, historically, we also have some modeling of uh, how the scatter happens, uh, how to use the, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, shining light data, trying to check the refraction index, et cetera, to correlate with certain portion of the scattering mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. So that there you have calibration data assisted by it's messier than, uh, than what I would say. Okay. But the result I show, my prediction of course ignore those effects, but the experimental <laughs> result is actually, I ignore it with adding truncations, but uh, uh, the experimental is actually let it go through the, yeah. they, are, they are, you know, 
dark out from quantum Fresno and others. And also there's a separate uh, nucleus there's a helping us to become interested in the efficiency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I mean, in the case of Millikan, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a molecular excitation for the scintillator, right? So, so there's a lot of questions there uh, for, you know, whether the, you know, a Q of 10 to the minus, uh, you know, a charge of 10 to the minus three is going to create a slightly different time constant, for example, for the, the, the molecular excitation and subsequent de-excitation to emit the light and, and et cetera. But so I, I agree with you that the argon case is very straightforward actually, but you're right, the CCD yeah. uh, case is probably a little bit more complicated, but still yeah. it's probably not as complicated as the plastic scintillator. Ah, so if I can, uh, again, you know, I thought about this uh, classic sensor detection a bit as well. Uh, the such energy transfer, energy deposition is actually dominated by single scatter. Uh, so single scatter dominance, even though we talk about the DX, yeah. the DX in the right yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. single scatter uh, 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 dominance. Then you, the, it's just a, for you, it's a relativistic particle, highly relativistic particle passing through the device. Mm -hmm. So I would say I, I can, again, do a single scatter calculation take it like that so and there's no there's no like the time things have had different time scales i would say a very small chart does not affect whatever the relaxation time or you know transition time for your molecular, molecular uh, uh, objects those time scale are so totally separate uh, uh, just to help you make your life simpler but that would, that would what i would think No other questions, and let's thank Chen again. Hi, everyone. Hey, it's good to see you. How are you? <laughs> Very good. Yeah. yeah.